In her casting show, Tom France conquered Israeli hearts with his cuisine. The German became Israel's master chef. Now he's taking us on a culinary expedition. Today, we're accompanying Tom Franz on a trip from the Judean hills to Galilee. Ancient olive trees line the gravel roads leading to the Judean mountain world. Here, agriculture has been practiced for 6,000 years. The heart of the Sataf National Park is home to one of Israel's most interesting cheesemakers, Shea Seltzer. Shea is a botanist. In the 70s, he gave up his university career and went to live in a monastery, where he learned the art of cheesemaking. He's going to show Tom his treasures in a limestone cave. Goat cheese in all stages of maturity. Wow, Shai. I'm amazed. It looks uh, wonderful. How many different cheeses do you have here in this uh, cave? We have mainly five different cheeses, because we are making the cheeses according to the plants that the goats eat. Milk, it is a platform for what the mother eats. For example, these ones are from the almond tree. When there's autumn, the leaves falling down from the almond, mm -hmm. The goats are eating the almond leaves, the, the dry leaves that they eat. And see, and, the, and the, what we have, it is very good for the skin. To eat the cheese is good for your skin. It, they, to eat right the now. cheese is very good for the skin because uh, almond oil is very, very good for the, for the skin. Mm. What happens with the cheese during the aging? I mean, this cave is high humidity and it's a low temperature. What happens inside the cheese? We are cleaning the all the time. The cheese is working, the bacteria is working. Cheese is something alive. It is never dead. You can find in Europe cheeses that are 200 years old, but they are edible and they are very good. Cheese is the, the willing of the milk for the infinity. What did you learn from cheese making for your own life? Do it very slow. Very slow. Everything can be, but very slow. I was in university till Yom Kippur War. And uh, when I came back after this war, I got my life a few times in my hand, and they said, hey, keep it. I feel that I'm a very lucky person, because I was born. Like everyone here, it's luck to be born. It is not a joke to be born. We didn't get this gift to be alive here just for nothing. Because in the minute that we will come back to God and He will look at us and say, hey, you got a present, what did you do with that? You cannot stand and say, I didn't do because, my wife, because I didn't have money. No, that's not the answer. Because the answer is, what did you do? What left from you?
And the only thing that you can do is to create. So I came here and I started to make a garden. I took vacation for six months. And after six months, I asked for another vacation. And then I stayed here for 42 years. It is not a joke. And every stone here, I put it on a place. Every, every stone, every stone, I put it by hand. Jay has retained his inquiring mind. He is tirelessly testing the effect of special cheeses on the human body. The coal dust on the cheese helps the body to absorb bacteria. Once a month, Iftach Beriket, a baker, visits Shay's farm. He's a friend of the cheesemakers. Iftach is one of the fathers of the growing vegan scene in Israel. He uses Shea's earth oven to bake bread, day and night, for a solid 48 hours. The result is not just any old bread, of course. It's for the, the earth people. Uh, it's food from the earth. It's not a, a commercial uh, packed food. It's something that brings all the, the power that is in the earth, uh, that the earth is growing and giving us so generously. Yeah. It's a real food. It's a, a food for, uh, for sustaining. Uh, uh, it's food for, for freedom uh, of uh, the body uh, and the mind. Uh. With this earth oven, uh, like it's binding all the elements in the bread, uh, the oven is made of, uh, of the earth, weed is the earth, the air is uh, uh, trapped inside the dough and rising it, the water awakening all this uh, process to a life, and the fire is sealing it. All the elements are in the bread. And now the taste is completely something different. Yeah. It is unbelievable. Hey, Iftah! Iftah, please. No. Pleasure. <laughs> no. This is simply love on first sight, this cheese. On first bite. <laughs> mm. Oh! And now this cheese was staying in Muscat Grappa. Wow. <laughs> now, this is seven, six years. If you were making these cheeses in another place but the Judean hills, would they get a different flavor? Completely. So what affects it? It's the climate, it's the air. It's the climate, it's the plant, it's the altitude. I'm eating part of, of this landscape. You are, you are eating what it is in Judea Hill, and I will never do it in another place. You cannot do it in another place, because it is here. Shea Seltzer's cheese has won international prizes. But if you want to buy some, you have to travel to the Judean Hills. The slow food activist only sells his cheese on his farm. As you see, big surprises, small surprises. Uh, as if, what is inside there? Uh, this is uh, currants uh, in cassis, the small ones. And uh, there are a few figs uh, that are uh, soaked in brandy and filled with uh, almond marzipan. How can I uh, buy after 
having been here in a supermarket again cheese or bread uh, it's not food what they're selling there anyway uh, i like, think this uh, is it now yeah? when you eat uh, industrial food from the supermarket uh, it's suiting a style of life of waking up in the morning, uh, going to work until four o'clock, five o'clock, coming back, being a, a good citizen uh, and doing all what you suppose. And you know, you trapped in this state of mind. But if you want to, to develop and uh, have fresh thoughts, have uh, uh, fresh ideas, you have to feed yourself with different things. If you want to have uh, original ideas, if you want to get uh, wild in your mind, eat wild food. The slow food producers of the region like to meet in Abu Ghosh, an Arab village some 10 kilometers away. The locals are Palestinians and have been Israeli citizens since 1948. They have a good culinary relationship with their Jewish neighbors. Hi. This is all from yours? You grow this? Uh, from me and other farmers, organic farmers. Wow, it's, it looks great. They call themselves artisans of food. They are the minds behind the new Israeli slow food movement. Once a month, Nadav Mali and the initiator brings together regional organic farmers and market visitors in Abu Ghosh. The pizza is fresh from the wood-fired oven, and the basil is from the Judean hills. The tomatoes taste like proper tomatoes. We decided to organize a market, but we didn't want like a slow uh, uh, farmer's market like everyone had. We wanted something with music, with uh, street food, with, with passion. And I know everyone by person. I know everyone, uh, everyone's product, what he makes. Uh, some people I work with, and uh, they're all excellent people with excellent products, and this is the best. Slow food, it's a movement. It's a movement born in Italy. We are growing in Israel. We are growing in Israel, starting new projects and with the, also with the youth movement of uh, Israel. And uh, we are ready to start working to, to promote a uh, new gastronomy where uh, food production is good, clean and fair. Slow food and club music. A Jewish party in an Arab village. Is this the way to build bridges? <laughs> when, you, when you deal with food, there is no language and there is no culture gaps. When you do food, you can get inside the kitchen of a 100 woman and work with her without any understanding of the language and make food together without any, any meaning of the language. It's like love. Amit Cohen is one of the chefs for peace, a group of Jewish, Christian and Muslim chefs. They use their culinary art to bring people of various faiths to one table. In the Gaza war, a cooking event showed in 2014 that it is possible to get along in Israel too. We made an evening meal with the chefs for peace and we invited the mayor of the village to bless everybody that were in the crowd. We did it during the war which was an amazing event because we had 200 people that came to eat in during the war for this cause. So I think it's connecting us. When you can see this village, there are a lot of Jewish people live here among the Arab, and we are not talking about uh, being together and coexistence. We live here. Coexistence without, you know, just being. And this is the difference. When it's an issue and you becoming talking about the issue and you discuss it, it's provided the problem a lot of space. When you're showing people that there is another path, another way, it's amazing and people can believe because it's another way to, to look at. Peace is a way to achieve things. And so I think really this village is an example for this. Food culture is a door opener not just for the chefs for peace. 
Tour operator Breaking Bread Journeys even have culinary tours to the Palestinian territories on offer. Elisa Moed, a Jew, and Christina Samara, a Palestinian, organize culinary encounters with residents of both sides of the Holy Land. We don't really go into politics. We only want to show the positive, the human element, that it's normal people who want to live a normal life, be it here or there. A shared meal is really an opportunity for people to you know, get to know each other. It's more than just food. Um, it's really an opportunity to talk to learn about somebody's life, to see their children, to see them in action. And it's um, more than anything else, you see what you have most in common as opposed to why you think you're different. We visit a Jewish settler in the West Bank, the official Israeli names of which are the biblical Judea and Samaria. The West Bank is uh, an area of, it consists of Judea and Samaria, and these are areas that are within the Palestinian territories, and it neighbors Israel to the east. There's about, uh, they say, around two and a half million um, Palestinians that live in that region. Jews started settling inside this area, I mean, way back. I mean, way back. I mean, Jews were inside, lived inside of Judea and Samaria, before the establishment of the State of Israel, just as Arabs lived inside of Israel, uh, which was then Palestine before the State of Israel. So historically, there have always been both populations on, on both sides. However, uh, this area was in what is considered Palestinian territories. Many of the settlements that you know, are being built now are considered illegal by um, international law. So that's been a real hot button issue. Mount Blessing, a vineyard in the Israeli settlement of Har Braka, above Nablus. More than 300 religious families live here. They have their own schools, nursery schools, and near Navi's vineyard. The vintner grows Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon and has invited Tom along with Elise and Christina for a tasting. Nir Navi produces 10,000 bottles of kosher wine per year. Tell me about some challenges to make the kosher wine and what does it mean in comparison to non-kosher wines? Does it have any effect of the quality or is it... Uh... No. All the workers in the winery have to be people that uh, keep the Shabbat. That's the first uh, you know, uh, thing that, uh, that is making a difference between a non-kosher winery or, or a kosher winery. There are people that have kosher wineries themselves are not keeping Shabbat persons, but they have, the workers are keeping Shabbat, you know? That's, that's the, the thing. In the old world, they used to talk about a, a kosher wines as wines that are not suitable for uh, table wines. They are used only for uh, holy, holy ceremonies, okay? But today we are planting for the last, even more than 20 years, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, etc., etc. Many, many varieties. These wines are made top class. Top class, like they made in Italy, in France, all around, South Africa, wherever you want. The place where your winery is is in Chomron. In Chomron, on this what can, you, can you explain us about this location in, I mean, in modern terms, in my terms that, you know, what makes problematic maybe to live uh -huh. here and also in biblical terms? Yes, uh, uh, the Chomron area, we have to write it also on the appellation, on, on, the, on, on the, the front label, we have to write it by law. Uh, is a part, integral part of Israel. People call it the West Bank, we know, but we live here like it's integral part of Israel. This land by the Bible was where all our fathers walked. It was Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 6, we see it. And later on, we see it in Jacob. Isaac used to live more in the south of Israel. And Jacob came over here and he pitched his tent just before the city of Shechem. 
where we live here, 800 meters from here. All of this is written in the Bible. And for us Bible believers, we like to come back to our roots. Tourists would now continue on to the market women of Nablus. We have to make do with the view, because as an Israeli citizen, Tom is not allowed to enter this zone of the Palestinian territories. Back in Israel, Tom visits a small Arab village outside Jerusalem. Ain Rafa. All the residents belong to one Arab family, Yakub Bahum's family. All, all of them are Muslim, of course. One family. One family? One family. Your family? Yes. All Bahum. How many people? 700. 700 people. All Your is. family? Yes. All cousins? All cousins. How is it to live as an Arab here in Israel, like, like you do? Here in this village, we uh, live in very peace uh, life uh, and we have good business with the Jewish uh, area because uh, people, uh, I have a restaurant, of course, in the village. So people, all the Jewish come to eat in my restaurant, not Arab. In fact, they are just Jewish because it's a little bit expensive and uh, people come from Tel Aviv. And now in Rafa, it's a little bit famous, a little bit. I, I hope one day it will be a nice hotel in this village and uh, shuk, uh, market. market. And also, we people like to make peace with Israeli and people, Jewish people. And to, work, yeah, and to work together. The Majda restaurant is a hidden gem. It's unusual, like the love story of Yaku Bahu, an Arab, was desperate to marry Michel Baranes, who is Jewish. The couple are now expecting their third child. How was it in the beginning for you both? I mean, you're Jewish, you're Muslim. How did you, I mean, you know, get over this, that you're coming from different peoples? For me, it was, first of all, very interesting. The language, the, the food, the, everything was like you are in going to another country. When I was in the army, I was, you know, I know Arab village just from the jeep or from the, that the, the thing that we've been uh, as a soldiers. Um, you have to fight, you have to do things, bad things. And we was very scared because they are the enemy. But when you come and you sit and you see the land and you meet the people, the youngers, you see, same people, the same dream, the same, it's, they're all the same and they all want to live. And this is how I uh, teach my children. For me, they're not half and half, they're not nothing. They're Adam and Lara. That's it. They're, they're human beings. That's it. This is the way that they look to the world. And that's what we want to show. Because sometimes people didn't know nothing about this. And uh, if like my dad, he was bringing people to his house to show how Arab live, how they sleep, how what they eat. Because the people in outside, uh, tourists, they don't know what happened. And really, in, in even Jews in the house, know. even Jewish in Tel Aviv, they can't know exactly what happened in Arab uh, house. And we have to open our houses for other people to know what happened there. With their small restaurant, Michal and Jakub have made the dream of peace in the Middle East come true in a very unspectacular way. Jakub built the blue house on the hill and farmed the land. Michal takes whatever she needs for cooking from her garden, which lies on the soil of their ancestors. In the beginning, I brought things from France and from uh, Italy, uh, olive oil and uh, spices and the uh, mushrooms and I I really understand that uh, the product supposed to be from here not also from Israel very near to my restaurant you stay here and you taste the the land this is the taste of the land of this village
Michelle cooks the way she thinks. It's very simple. Shrimps falafel. Her signature dish breaks all culinary barriers. Shrimp isn't kosher. The beetroot horseradish is an old Jewish recipe. The chef mixes it all up and wraps it Arab style in a falafel. This falafel, falafel, it's Arab food. And chrein, it's Ashkenaz. This is the thing. We are not Jewish or, or Arab. We are people that meet people and um, take things that we like and we mix it like that and something happening. And this dish, it's very famous dish here and people very like it. People say that it's different food and they feel something. I don't know what they take from I can it. tell you what it is. What? When I see you and I see, hear you talking about cooking, one main ingredient you put in every dish is love. Yes. yes, yes, yes. This is the thing. People eat your uh, your feeling. People, it's it's hitting in the guts. You know, it's. Uh, I always say, don't speak, feel, eat, uh, look. I mean, this looks so special and so wonderful. I'm a little bit, uh, you know, yes. sorry that I keep kosher and I will not be able to eat this. You know that. Uh, to the, according to the kashrut, uh, the seafood is, is not allowed to eat, so I can imagine a little bit what it's going to be like. It's nice, it's um, very crispy, mm -hmm. it's like, it's nice. Take the falafel. You can see it's pinky and nice <laughs> and crispy. Bon appetit. Some parts of the story you tell from uh, your relationship reminds me my own relationship. You come both from two peoples that have a uh, very special history and uh, you know not always had and sometimes still don't have peace and I myself I, I come from Germany my wife she's Jewish Israeli and uh, she comes from a family that uh, you know many people from my mother's side were killed in the Holocaust and today we live together I'm, and I'm accepted in her family and, and she comes to me with me to Germany, to my family, and uh, we lead a normal life. I mean, we have uh, love, we have the problems of a relationship between man and woman, but we're not living the, the problems of our nations. Yeah. And, and this is, I mean, we cannot teach the whole nations to be like us, but, you know, we, we give them something to think about. And, and there are many people that are interested to hear, especially this story, because it's like, wow, this is possible today already? And again, and it's, it's a very beautiful thing, so pretty nice. Your story is very inspiring. Passing olive groves and banana plantations, we head to the north of Israel, to Galilee, the land of milk and honey. Long before Biblical times, people grew wine here. Under Islamic rule, wine production was banned for centuries. It was only in the 1980s that Israel had a veritable wine revolution. The vineyard of the Tulip Winery is situated on the Lebanon border. Roy Itzaki had a vision when he founded Tulip in 2003. Actually, when I started uh, 11 years ago, um, I had in mind three main goals. First, to produce the top, top, top quality wine that can't produce in Israel. Second goal was to produce this quality, but not so expensive, um, like my colleague sells the wine. And the third goal was to do something for the community. 
I decided to, to establish the winery in Kfar Tikva, village of hope in English. Uh, it's a special place that all the citizens are mentally disabled people. So I established and opened the winery over there in order to employ the people from the village in, uh, in the winery. The winery is right in the middle of a village for people with special needs. The 200 residents of Kufar Tikva can lead a self-determined life and work in different businesses according to their inclination. Tulip employs 30 of them. Manager Orban Avi talks about a project with hurdles. This is the first model, not only in Israel, but in the world, as far as we know, that a winery that produces quality wines um, really work with the most amazing people. You know, they used to feel like outsider. They always felt um, like they don't belong. And now the fact that we open the winery in their home uh, make us, you know, be the strangers in their home. So they are the normal, they host us. Actually, I was afraid from the, the idea to, to produce wine with people with uh, special needs because I thought to myself, I was a very young businessman, I thought to myself, who will buy a quality, top quality wine that mentally disabled people made? Uh, that was my first afraid. And second, I'm not a social guy, I'm a businessman. Uh, to be involved with these people every minute, every hour, every day, uh, I thought it would be a big, big challenge for me because I, I have no experience with people uh, with uh, special needs. Both of them, uh, in five minutes, it's disappeared. It's just amazing, the emotional connection between us. 90% of all wines in Israel are produced in a kosher way. But you only get the rabbi certificate if Orthodox Jews press and bottle the grapes. Not even Roy himself is allowed to touch the wine. He has been on an odyssey through the jungle of religious dictates and bans. I had one problem. In order to be kosher, the people, the workers in the winery needs to be religious people. It's not enough that they are Jewish, need to be religious. Um, so in the beginning they asked me to fire the workers and hire religious instead, but you can't do that because for these people, for these workers with the mental uh, disabled, for them it's the whole life and you can't fire them. Since then I met uh, more than 40 different rabbis uh, to find a solution between our Bible uh, and the rules from the Bible to uh, the real life that uh, it's also mitzvah, good things that we're doing uh, by, by employing those people. Um, the 40 and something rabbis uh, the last one told me, okay, you compromise a little bit and I will compromise a little bit and we'll find the solution and the way that you can still employ those people and uh, to become kosher. So it took me four years, uh, but patient was uh, good. At 300,000 bottles a year, Tulip is the largest boutique winery in Israel. The commitment was worth it, and not just in the economic sense. I think it changed my life completely. I discovered myself again. You know, I learned about myself, that how, how, uh, how tolerant I can be and how patient I can be, and that even though I don't have children yet, so I can completely function as a mother for our employees. It's so much fun. They give me um, perfect reason to wake up in the morning and to come here to work, uh, their smile, and it's a big bless and big joy. Situated in the mountainous region of Galilee is Pekiin with its peace doves at the entrance. 
Most of the residents are Druze, an Arab religious community which has always had a touch of mystery about it. The Druze grow fruit and breed pomegranates, which is thought to be a fruit of faith. The 613 kernels of the pomegranate correspond to the number of Jewish religious laws. The Druze are famous for their pita bread, which is baked in a very special way on a very special oven. What is this? This is a pita. A Drusian pita? Yes. How do you make it? It's a special pita. Everybody uses yeast. I don't. Just water, salt, dark wholemeal flour, and that's it. All that? It's very healthy. Great. You can eat it with cream cheese, chocolate, hummus, za'atar, with everything. It tastes good with meat too. But it's not just the bread which is different in Peking. The way people treat each other here is also special. The grand dame of the village, Grandma Jamila, talks to us. We're in a special place here, Pekin. Correct. You grew up here. What's different about this village? My family has been living here for more than 1,500 years. We have four religions here. Druze, Christians, Muslims and Jews. They all live together like a family. Here, the women often had to help out in the fields. And when a woman had a baby, she would hand it over to the neighbors while she was working in the field. But we never paid attention to whether the neighbors were Christians, Jews, Muslims or Druze. This way, a Druze baby would grow up on the milk of a Jew or a Jewish baby with the milk of a Muslim or a Christian. We have always felt like one big family. For this reason, I and the other of my generation are called the milk siblings. In the east of Galilee lies the Sea of Galilee. Here Jesus worked with his disciples 2,000 years ago. Many of them were fishermen, like Menachem. Tom rides with him on his boat. The most important species of fish was also named after one of Jesus' disciples. It's called Peter's fish. When you go fishing here for 36 years, you must have a very special relationship to this water, to this lake. When you come to Sea of Galilee, special, the Christian people, they come to the Sea of Galilee. And they come, first of all, they have something in life. They have the water. And then suddenly they get excited because they eat the same fish that Peter catch, catch 2,000 years ago. You even touch the history and they, you even eat the history like it was 1,000 years ago. This is the nice in this lake, except everything in the world. Menachem works on Israel's largest freshwater lake. Often more water was taken out than was good for nature, and fishing had to stop. So how you choose the fish? You have two kinds of fish. You see, this one is a thin one, and this one is heavy. It's a, this one has a lot of meat here. Okay. So this one going back to the water, is this one going to the box. Mm -hmm. In the Sea of Galilee, it is not allowed to bring fish less than 20 centimeters. So the rest of the fish, The Sea of Galilee is now very nice and suddenly it just changed. You know, you have in the Bible some miracles. It's not stories, it's true. That's the reason when it starts to be the lake angry, but I mean storm, 
I better say thank you to the lake and drive home safely. Situated on the north bank of the Sea of Galilee is another legendary location which connects history and food in a special way. It's the church of the multiplication of the loaves and fish at Tabgha. Here, Jesus is said to have performed one of his miracles. Today, it's a place of pilgrimage and a small convent of the Benedictine order. Here, Tom meets Father Nicodemus. He's an old acquaintance who has already shown him around Jerusalem. What is this special place, Nicodemus? As you can see, we have the stone under the altar where Jesus is supposed to have put the loaves and fish. And here is the 4th century mosaic which shows the fish and the four loaves of bread. The story goes that Jesus preached here on the north bank of the Sea of Galilee and night fell. There were a lot of people here, 5,000 plus women, plus children. And the disciples asked Jesus, well, what should we do with them? How should we feed them? There are no cities here. There is nothing here. What should we do? Jesus said, let's see what we have here. The disciples reply, five loaves of bread and two fish. Jesus says, very well, let the people sit down and share them out. And that's the miracle. There is enough for everyone. And there are even 12 baskets left. That's what this mosaic shows. Eating together is very important to Christianity. Do you want to tell me more? Yes. Jesus shared these loaves. He fed the people, satisfied them. And that is our task too. Not just to feed ourselves, but to make sure everyone is fed. The Benedictines at Tabga have committed themselves to this task. These days, in the Garden of the Seven Springs, disadvantaged families of all faiths can rest for a few days. According to the Bible, the shore is a place where Jesus liked to retreat. Father Nicodemus tells us that Jesus lived here with his disciples who were fishermen, right here on the northeast bank of the Sea of Galilee. And he also performed miracles on the lake. There's a beautiful story of him walking on water. The whole region has preserved the last 2,000 years much better than Jerusalem, which is completely built up now, and where the visitor can no longer walk in the original footsteps of Jesus. 